And when she came down to my bedroom, she found me on the floor, unresponsive, unconscious. When I arrived at the Frankston Hospital 93 minutes later, my heart miraculously just started beating by itself. There was an open door and I had to make a decision. Do I go through that door and see the people that I've lost, that I miss dearly, or do I stay over this side of the door and go back to my children. Cardiac arrest can happen to anyone at any age, at any time. It's taken that fear of death away from me. Like, I no longer have that. Don't be caught dead. The show bringing stories of death back to life. Here's your host, Catherine Ashton. Today I'm speaking with Justine Phillips, the sudden cardiac arrest survivor and the founder of Heart Matters Australia. I'm really looking forward to our conversation today. Welcome to the show, Justine. Hello, how are you? Good, thank you. That's good. Now, I normally ask people a question about their experience with death to open up the show, but I've never had the opportunity to speak to someone who actually died themselves. And let me explain this because as you explained on your website, Mm-hmm. For 93 minutes, you had continual CPR and you were clinically dead. Could you perhaps tell that story? Absolutely. So I guess first of all I'll explain what sudden cardiac arrest is because there can be some confusion around sudden cardiac arrest. And sudden cardiac arrest is when your heart stops beating. And when I say stops beating, the heart stops pumping the blood around the body to the vital organs, which essentially keeps us upright and alive. And what it does is your heart is either stopped or else it's erratically beating. So it's beating so fast that it actually can't get any blood into the heart whatsoever to pump that around the body. So what happens in that instance is a person then will suddenly collapse, become unconscious and unresponsive. And without CPR and defibrillation, that person then will pass away. So there's a very short time frame for someone to intervene, commence CPR, and then that person's heart defibrillated to shock it back into rhythm to keep them alive. So in my instance, I had my cardiac arrest at home during the lockdown period back in July 2020. Now, I'm a single parent, so I was home with my children and they were actually homeschooling that day. So even though COVID was a terrible time, for me, there's a lot of positives that came out of COVID. I'm here today. So we were home. It was my son's 16th birthday. My daughter was in the kitchen. She had decided that she wanted to make him something for his birthday lunch. I had actually, at the time I was a personal trainer, so I had come down to my bedroom to record a workout that I could put up on my socials that that if anyone wanted to work out, they had some, an exercise little program that they could do that day. So I had come up here and my daughter had this funny feeling when she was in the kitchen that she just needed to run it past me what she should cook her brother for lunch. And when she came down to my bedroom, she found me on the floor, unresponsive, unconscious. Now my son was having a shower at the time, so she alerted him he quickly jumped out. Anyway, they both came into the room and they called triple zero. My daughter at the time was just so shocked from what had happened. The triple zero operators told her to go out to the front of our driveway and wait for the ambulance. And they advised my son to start CPR. So my son had to start CPR and they believed that was in a matter of minutes of me actually collapsing. So he had to perform CPR until the ambulance officers arrived and they arrived approximately nearly eight minutes after the call was made. So the ambulance officers arrived along with the local fire brigade. They came in, the firefighters took over the CPR while the ambulance officers just started doing what they needed to do to assess what had gone on and check vitals and all that sort of stuff. So once they arrived, they called the MICA paramedic, which is the paramedics that come out that have had additional training that provide intensive care treatment. They arrived. Within a 25-minute period, I'd been defibrillated eight times. 
my heart had not returned to a normal beating rhythm. So what they had to do is they had to make a decision on whether or not they would continue care or else if they would just stop and that was it. And luckily for me, because I was so young, I was 46 when I had my cardiac arrest, I was young, I had children and I was fit because as I mentioned earlier, I was a personal trainer at the time, they decided to keep working on me and they made the call to the Frankston Hospital. And when I arrived at the Frankston Hospital 93 minutes later, and the 93 minutes is from the time of call to arrival at Frankston Hospital, when they were transferring me from the ambulance trolley to the hospital bed, my heart just miraculously just started beating by itself. Now, what happened is once they had made the decision to keep working on me, instead of having CPR performed by an individual person, they decided to connect the mechanical CPR machine, also known as the Lucas machine. So that actually takes over the compressions for you. So it allows the paramedics to do what they need to do without having someone having to focus on performing CPR. They've got a machine for that? Yes, they do. And it's, it's brutal, but it's very effective. I've had the opportunity to actually see one working on a mannequin and it's actually when you, when I stood there watching it, I was just like, oh, my goodness, that is what was pumping my chest at the time. And, yeah, I don't know, it, it's brutal, but when you watch it, it's it's so effective and, you know, it's performing CPR at a depth that we need to be performing CPR, which then limits the chances of a person having brain damage because blood's not getting to the brain. So they're very beneficial. So once I had actually, my heart had started beating, they then had to sedate me because I'd been intubated at home before I was taken to hospital. I was biting on the intubation tube. So they had to sedate me. I was taken to what they call a cath lab, which is where they run a whole heap of tests on your heart. And it had shown that... With my particular heart, I had an enlarged left ventricle, which is also known as Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, broken heart syndrome, which is caused from physical and emotional stress. So I had Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. They then put me in an induced coma and I was in there for four days. And I was once they took, because they weren't sure to start off with if I was going to survive the event. So for my family, because it was during covid there was no one allowed at the hospital at all. So that was on the Wednesday. It wasn't until the Friday afternoon that signs were looking good and they knew that I was going to be okay and survive it. But they didn't know whether or not I would have any brain injuries, what my outcomes were going to be. So once I came out of that, I was in hospital for a little bit down on the Mornington Peninsula and then I was transferred to the Alfred Hospital and there I had surgery and had a, what they call an ICD implanted in me, which is an implantable cardio defibrillator. So what that is, it's a pacemaker and a defibrillator all in one. So that just monitors my heart now moving forward, which is great to have because it's a little safety net. But, yeah, that is pretty much my story. There's so many questions that I have. Yeah. Firstly, I have to congratulate you on remembering all the correct terms because they seem like a mouthful. Oh, look, there's a lot of them and some of them I still get wrong every now and then because, yeah, as we know, medical terminology can be a bit of a tongue twister and, yeah, there's a lot of it. (laughs) Yeah, I bet you there is. The first thing that comes to mind from your story Mm -hmm. is you say that your daughter was in shock. So it was interesting that the paramedics identified that, that were on the call and sent her out Absolutely. of the situation to yes. do meeting the, the ambulance. And then obviously then identified some particular skills or strengths that they found in your son to be able to, I assume, did he know CPR at all? No. So he had never had any CPR training through school or anything prior to my event. So the triple zero operator actually guided him through what he needed to do. And the triple zero operator was yeah obviously fantastic with him because he the CPR that he performed was effective CPR. It kept my blood pumping around my body so that the only side effects I have 
since having the cardiac arrest is my brain gets fatigued very easy, but after being down for 93 minutes, I'm told that's going to that's going to happen. I'm going to fatigue easy. The body gets tired easy. I can be talking and I can feel I can I know what I want to say, but I can't sometimes think of the word that I'm trying to get out. And sometimes I can be talking and if I pause for too long, I can actually forget what I was talking about. So they're the only side effects. So in that instance, I'm very lucky that the CPR that I actually got was good quality effective CPR by my son guided by that triple zero operator. And from my understanding, CPR seems to change if anyone has done CPR through work or anything like that. It seems to be one thing that is constantly being updated with new thoughts and guidelines. So is it my understanding correct where it's the palpitation on the chest to actually keep the blood circulating that is the the priority in CPR? Absolutely. So the best way I put it when I'm talking to someone is that when you think your heart, and for us sitting here right now, is automatically just pumping blood around the body. We don't have to think about it. It just automatically does that. However, when our heart stops, our heart can't, can no longer pump blood around the body. So we need to become that manual pump for the heart. So the big push is on ensuring our compressions are correct in regards to the depth that we require and the rate that we require so on an adult for example we want to be aiming around five four to five centimeters depth from the chest so that way we're getting that those compression rates down we're letting that heart we're pumping that heart and we, then when we come up we want to make sure that we get the full rise of the chest and then compress again because what that does is that allows the heart to refill with blood and as we compress down we're then pumping that blood around the body so yes definitely the compression depth is vital as well as the rate because if we're pumping if we're doing our compressions too slow we're not pumping the heart fast enough to be able to push that blood all the way around the body if we're pumping doing pumping or sorry if we are doing our compressions too fast we're not allowing the heart to recoil to be able to fill up with blood to then push around the body so yeah, definitely the compressions are such a vital part. And five centimetres is quite mm. deep, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, you, I now, since I had the cardiac arrest, I now actually teach CPR. I'm qualified to do that. And the biggest question that comes up is, oh, but what happens if I, you know, break a rib? Mm. At the end of the day, if you break a rib or, you know, you, there's some form of injury to a rib, it means you're doing good compressions because we need to get that compression death. Unfortunately, yes, that will happen to that person, but what's the alternative? If we don't perform CPR, that person will pass away, unfortunately. So, yeah, there's always going to be a nasty noise that you're going to hear. I know after mine I was so sore for a couple of months after it, but in saying that, that I was happy to put up with that because I'm still here today. Yeah, of course. Mm. And what does the breath play in the role? Is that still part of the process or? So the, the Australian Resuscitation Council guidelines, when you complete a CPR course, state that you must do 30 compressions, two breaths, 30 compressions, two breaths. Now that's the same whether you're performing CPR on an infant, a child or an adult. So, yes, there's two breaths involved. However... If you go on a, you're out on a walk and you stumble across someone who has collapsed, they're unresponsive, and you need to commence CPR, you might not be comfortable giving the two breaths to a complete stranger, which I don't know if I would be if I if I had no idea what their background was. I'm not too sure I would be keen on doing the breaths on a complete stranger. So focusing on those compressions becomes your priority. So yes, the breaths are also included, but in today's world, unfortunately, we can't, we don't know everyone's background. We don't know what their illnesses are at the time. So you might not want to do the breaths. And as long as you're doing the compressions, that's 
yeah, as far as I'm concerned, that's a, that's a priority. And just thinking about that also is the like car accidents, things like that, that you may come across where people might get blood or something like that. And that's why I know the first aid kit we bought last year had the little thing that you can put a, a, over people's mouths. Yeah, so it's great. These days there's so many variations on instruments that you can use in that situation. You've got masks, like a little mask that you can put over the mouth. There's lots of little key rings that you can get now that will have a little plastic sheet in there with a mouthpiece there that you can blow into. So there's definitely items out on the market that you can use and carry around with you, whether that's in a first aid kit, it's in a key ring on your set of car keys, there are options there. And with that, I will add that the breaths actually increase a person's chance of survival by 15%. So that's why those breaths, yeah. So yes, they are important, but also we know that people don't like to do the actual breaths. That's okay. Just as long as you can start compressions and continue compressions to help arise or the person becomes responsive. And this is something from what I understand from your story is we need to be aware of given the fact that you were 46, a personal trainer. Did you have any indication, family history? No, so I can look back now and I can see that I did have some signs and the signs that I had was there was a little bit of shortness of breath. However, I put that down to that I had asthma because when I get run down, I'd get asthma and I have a bit of shortness of breath. So that's what I put it down to because I was training excessively going on long walks and everything so I just put it down to having asthma because I was tired and run down I never ever thought it would have been something to do with my heart and the cardiac arrest and I guess that's the thing an important takeaway from this is that cardiac arrest can happen to anyone at any age at any time there are no guidelines when it comes to cardiac arrest it does not discriminate at all and I think that's probably been the biggest wake up call for me because cardiac arrest, I thought that was a heart attack to, in all honesty, but cardiac arrest and heart attack are so different. And the best way you can explain the difference is with a heart attack, it's blockage of the artery. So it's like a plumbing issue. Whereas with a cardiac arrest, it's an electrical fault. Your heart is playing up. So that's how you distinguish between the two. So yeah, look, I was oblivious. I honestly thought, yeah, heart attack, cardiac arrest is the same thing, but they're totally different. And with a heart attack, a person can have a heart attack and their heart's still beating and they're still breathing, whereas with a cardiac arrest, the person will collapse, they'll be unresponsive. So there's, there are very important differences, but we just don't talk about it. So, And are they treated differently? Absolutely. So, you know, with a heart attack, as I said, their hearts can still be beating. So that person, you just want to sit still and wait for the ambulance to come. Whereas with cardiac arrest, that person's heart's not beating. So we need to commence CPR immediately to give them any chance of survival. Well, I suppose the big difference from that is that one will be conscious or possibly conscious and the other won't be. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the thing is someone can also have a heart attack and then have a cardiac arrest as well. So, you know, when you look into it medically, there's so many things that can lead to a cardiac arrest. You know, it's not just maybe a heart attack and cardiac arrest. As you said, it could be from a car accident. It could be from a drowning, a drug overdose, alcohol poisoning. Like there's lots of things that can cause cardiac arrest. But not heart attack because that's a plumbing issue. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. I love the fact that It's a plumber, you call for one problem, and an electrician, you call for another. Absolutely. That's a great way to look at it. Yeah, Yeah, it is definitely. It's the best way to explain it to someone. Yeah, that's really clever. And tell me, what are your memories of that time when you had your cardiac arrest? I actually don't have any. I lost a month's worth of memory around that period of time. So for me, it's interesting. I could sit here and talk about cardiac arrest all day because I, I, cause I, because I can't remember anything. I don't have any emotional attachment to it. So it's very easy for me to talk about it. Whereas when you talk about my children and the effects it's had on them, that's when I become emotional because 
I see how it's affected them and it's it's not nice and to see the on effect, the on flow effects that it still has today you know I think oh my goodness like you know that really breaks my heart that that's affected them as such but yeah I'd my first memories of after the cardiac arrest is the day I'm actually leaving the hospital in the alpha when I was being discharged and I had my dad come down from country Victoria to pick me up I remember being in the wheelchair being wheeled out they had to wheel me down to the entrance of the hospital where he was allowed to come into the hospital to collect me but then we had to leave straight away so that's my first memory after the incident however in saying that like I know there were conversations that were had because I knew something had gone wrong I couldn't remember what they had said I'd had but everyone was talking about cardiac arrest so I would just go along with conversations that okay was a cardiac arrest and even though I can't remember the conversation of someone sitting down with me saying this is what happened I know we had that conversation and I know that we had the conversations about going to the Alfred to have the the ICD implanted in my chest so yeah it's it's a really strange period of time for me that trying to remember around that time it's just yeah there's no memory so it's really hard to explain and it must be amplified by the fact that you didn't have any family around you to hear those conversations because it was during COVID yeah exactly so the way I would communicate with people like we all did was via telephone so it's interesting hearing the people I was talking to the conversations I was having with them because a lot of them particularly early on after I came out of the ICU, I was very bit agitated. My personality was different to who I usually am. So it's quite interesting hearing those sorts of conversations because it's like, oh, wow, that's so not me. But that was just due to the brain injury at the time, the brain recovering from the episode I just had. So, yeah, it's interesting. But it's good to know for people listening that that is a normal process that, can happen yeah absolutely the the brain's been through the not just the brain the whole body's been through a traumatic event and our brain will block out information to protect us because you can't really remember much about that time certainly that that month block is it when you think about your children that was one of the motivating factors for starting heart matters absolutely because I, I can see the trauma that, you know, that they've been through. I've been through it with them in regards to after it. Like we'd have incidences and there'd only be little incidences or little triggers that would set them off. And, you know, so I can see how this has affected them. And for me, it's just Heart Matters Australia came around because lots of people that I spoke to didn't know what cardiac arrest was. They thought heart attack, cardiac arrest was the same and didn't know how to treat cardiac arrest. And the most important thing we can do is educate ourselves on how to perform CPR so that if we ever need to know or if we even need to provide CPR on someone, we all know what we need to do. Um, We're not flying in blind and we're giving that person the best chance at life. But also I think that if we can equip ourselves with those skills, what it does is if that person makes it fantastic, we did an amazing job. If that person doesn't make it, That is a real shame, but we did the best we could with the skills and the knowledge that we had. And I think that's important because particularly if I look at it from a parent and a child, if I had a past, my kids would have carried that guilt with them forever and a day because they wouldn't have known how to perform effective CPR, which, you know, that's not on them. That's on me as a parent to ensure that they know that. But you know, they're always going to be questioning, oh, I should have done this, I should have done that because they didn't have the training. Whereas if we can provide everyone with the training, whether they are children, whether they are adults, if we can provide everyone with the training of performing good quality effective CPR, well, then that person knows that they did the best they could with the skills and the knowledge that they had. And tell me, what is Heart Matters doing to to increase the education? Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier on, I can now officially teach first aid and CPR. So for me, my goals are to go around and teach as many people as I can, whether they are community groups, sporting groups, 
businesses, families, friendship groups, is to teach everyone how to perform effective CPR. And I say effective CPR because, you know, we want to make sure we've got good compression depth and good compression rate. And if we have that, that's effective CPR. So teaching everybody effective CPR and also how to use defibrillators because there's, you know, there's this thought that defibrillators can only be used by people who are being trained and, you know, no one wants to touch them because they're not too sure how they work. So I want to take that stigma away that, you know, only someone who's trained can use a defibrillator and, oh, we don't touch those, they're scary, we're going to get a shock, all this sort of stuff. So anyone can use a defibrillator. So, yeah, for me it's about teaching CPRs and how to use a defibrillator but also raising funds to get defibrillators out into communities and the defibrillators that we put out in communities, that they're accessible 24-7 any time of the day, any time of the week for anyone so that if anyone needs it, they can just go and get the defibrillator and use it. It's interesting to say that because sometimes defibrillators are put in the most weirdest spots behind yeah. locked doors mm. and in public yeah. places. That's kind of useless, isn't it? Absolutely, because if you can't get a key to get into that door, well, the defibrillator is useless, so to speak. And, you know, as I've said Cardiac arrest happens any time of the day, you know, so we can't just have them available between 9 and 5 because that person might have a cardiac arrest at 6 p.m. at night and we don't have access to the defibrillator, whereas if we can get defibrillators out in our communities where they're accessible 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, you know, it provides a bit of security and comfort for that local community knowing that if something was to happen, they know where that defibrillator is and that they can use it. And from my memory, they're almost idiot proof. Oh, absolutely. Because like you just pop them on and then if the heart's fine, it doesn't do anything. Absolutely. All you do is you just press the on button and then you listen to the instructions. They will tell you, they will give you step-by-step instructions on what you need to do. So you turn the button on and you just follow the instructions. And as you said, if the person's got a heartbeat, they will not be delivered a shock by the defibrillator. It will only shock a person if their heart is in a shockable rhythm. Yeah, and I like the, it was just sort of like Siri telling me what to do. And I'm like, yeah. okay. Yeah, absolutely. And the great thing is, you know, a lot of them will have a tone so for the compression rate that you need to do. Because you put the yeah. once the, the defibrillator arrives, why a person's performing CPR you have the other person put the pads on and it will tell you to stand clear why it runs its analysis and, and does what it needs to do. But if a defibrillator needs to deliver a shock and it does, and then it, say, for example, it hasn't restarted their heart and you are required to commence CPR again, it will tell you to commence CPR. A lot of them will have a light and or a beeping sound. So it gives you a compression rate. Yeah, I remember that actually. Now you're saying it. Yeah. It had a beep, the one that I was using. Yes, exactly. So it was really, really helpful. Absolutely. So, you know, yeah, we we need to get rid of that stigma that, you know, defibrillators are dangerous to use and you should only use them if you've been trained. Definitely anyone can use them. They are so, they are are very user friendly. And tell me, what sort of changes have you had in your life since your cardiac arrest? Yeah, so for me, at the time I was a personal trainer when I had the cardiac arrest, I've since stopped doing that and that's a personal reason just because if I can't train the way I would train someone, I don't want to do that. I don't think that's fair that I ask someone to do something that I can't necessarily do, even though medically there's a a reason why. It's just, that's just, just me. But yeah, I'm just more aware of sort of, environments I put myself in I get very fatigued easy if there's a lot of people so I tend to I will go but I just know that my time there will be short because I just find it too overwhelming too fatiguing and what else oh yeah there's lots of changes just physically I don't push myself like I used to in regret when it comes to training or exercise I tend to steer clear of a lot of high impact training I just will at the moment, I just go for walks and just do strength training. So for me, that that works well. Yeah, I guess I just know that there's just 
job up like if I was to step back from Heart Matters Australia I know that there's limited job opportunities that I would have like if it was something that required me to stand up on my feet all day I couldn't do that five days a week probably actually in all honesty I in regards to the fatigue I don't think I'd be able to hold down a full-time job mm. because I I find the mental capacity particularly to be really draining so I know that if I'm at home and I spend a lot of time on the computer working, like once I shut that down, it's like, okay, I'm I'm done now. I will either have a nap or else I just need to sit and just have quiet time and not talk. And so there's a few things that, yeah, that have really changed. It sounds like your pace has slowed down. Yeah, Absolutely. But obviously you're still very busy at the same time. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, but I'm busy doing the stuff that I'm passionate about. I'm not busy, you know, out socialising or doing things that don't fill my cup. It's all I'm doing thing I'm busy with things that fill my cup. And is that one of the big changes? Oh, absolutely. I used to be a yes person. I was never a oh no, look, sorry, I'm I am i can not take that on right now. I was a yes person, a people pleaser. And now that's, yeah, that's changed. And have your priorities changed along that line? Yeah, look, I don't, I certainly don't sweat over the small stuff. I used to worry about everything, whereas now I only worry about what I can control. I don't worry about what's out of my control. And I surround myself with people that I want to be around. And I do things that I want to do. I don't necessarily do things that I know will make me feel uncomfortable. And I mean that in a sense that it's just something that I will dislike completely and it's I, I'm not going to get any value out of it. So has it made you, you know, feel like I'd be more reckless in relation to whatever I said? I'd just be quite, you know, open about my thoughts and feelings. Have you had something along that line? Yeah, look, I have a tendency to sit back and observe and that's just what I do. I sit back and observe. Previously, I might have automatically jumped, whereas now I sit back and observe because I just think, is this worth me saying something and potentially causing upset or an issue that I really don't want to involve myself in or put any more energy into? So in that sense... Yeah, look, if I get to a certain point and I think, no, this is continuing behaviour, I'm not having that, I will say something. But other times I will just assess, is this really worth my energy? And if it's not, I just think, oh, you, you go do you, or, you know, depending on what the situation is and where and who it's with or whatever, I'll just remove myself from a situation and I either won't go back or, yeah, <laughs> I just cut it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm brutal. So no, so yeah, that's is that's where yeah, that, that's probably what I do. And tell me, any memories from when you actually had that ninety three minutes where you weren't meeting? I guess the only memory I have, which has come about through breath work, I've often had the thought: Do maybe I go see a hypnotherapist to try and take myself back to that time? I haven't ventured down that track. However, I've done breath work. I've got a very good friend who facilitates breath work sessions and done quite a few of his. And I did have one really profound session where I guess the best way to describe it is for me, it feels like where I went when I was in that limbo period of choosing to stay or go, so to speak. And it's a feeling of just being in an open area and it's nothing but love and light. And I know that probably sounds very cliche, but I really don't know how to explain it apart from using those two words. It was just it was so full of love and just the lightness. It was like anything that was heavy had been left behind and it was just a beautiful, peaceful, loving space. And I couldn't see, like there was a bright white light that was up above my head. I couldn't see anything, but I could feel. So it was more like I knew that my 
loved ones were there. I couldn't see them, but I could feel their presence. That's the only experience I've had where I can remember anything. But after I had that, it was, I had this profound feeling of everything's okay. Like before I'd had that experience, there was lots, I had a lot of questions myself, but after that experience, it was, I'm okay. And I know where I'm going when I end up there, that it's going to be okay. Cause it's just, it was peaceful and beautiful. Like it was really beautiful. It's probably the only way I can describe it. Wow. That's absolutely amazing. And I wouldn't say it's cliche. Obviously there's something in that because Mm. the stories throughout time are very similar. Yeah. But that's amazing that you feel that way. Oh, absolutely. And I haven't really had a lot of conversations with people about this experience. I have a handful of people because, you know, I know people be out there like, oh, yeah, right, she's making that up. But it's just, yeah, it's honestly I, I can't explain it. It's just it's taken that, you know, that fear of death away from me. Like I no longer have that because I know that where I'm going it's beautiful and yeah and I I say cliche because I guess you know I guess what before I had my experience I was always wondering what there was and you know you hear people say oh it's you know love and light and that sort of stuff I'm like everyone always uses that and I never really understood but that's yeah it's just that's the way that I can describe it really to yeah love and light Mm. What a beautiful thing to think that that's what's there. Absolutely, absolutely. And I know people say that they have the experience where they visualise their loved ones. I never had that, but I had the feeling, the feeling of love and, you know, which I think for me is probably, would be more beneficial than having the visual, like seeing them, like actually feeling their love was what I needed when I had that experience. And isn't it interesting that it appeared to you in a manner that you needed it yeah absolutely absolutely and I guess also is that when I've had that experience the memory of the experience it's been a time that I've also been ready for that experience to remember that particular moment when I was in limbo yeah as to do I stay do I go and I'm very fortunate I've got two friends who are very intuitive and they don't know each other and I've had separate conversations with them and they have both said to me that, you know, where you went, you were quite happy and neither of them knew if I would come back. One in particular, she was channeling in and she just said that she did not know which way I was going to go. And so, yeah, so I find it very interesting that these two individuals who are on separate sides of Australia have both had similar feelings about and not the the feeling that not knowing what I was going to do and that I was conflicted. So I found that rather fascinating. And when you remember that experience, is it a memory that you you have, do you think? Is that the right thing to call it? I honestly, I, it's, it's obviously a memory that I've had to work, do a bit of work with for it to actually come forward because For me, that came forward in a breathwork session. Mm -hmm. So it's obviously one of the memories that have been suppressed throughout that one-month period of losing memory from that period of time around the event of the cardiac arrest. So I I guess it's a memory that's ingrained, but it's just something that for me that had to be released through a particular practice, yeah. And when you recall that memory, do you feel that there was a choice that you were there? you had to be pulled one way or another as you were talking about what your friends were saying? With that particular memory that we just spoke about, no. But I've had another experience in a breathwork session that I'd done earlier to that one and I have a memory of it was like, the only way I could describe it, it was like I was on one side of the door and there was an open door and I had to make a decision Do I go through that door and see the people that I've lost that I miss dearly or do I stay over this side of the door 
and go back to my children. So I have had a breathwork session where I have had a moment where I've felt like I needed to make a decision. And that one I found a really traumatic experience. Like I was sobbing throughout that and I was sobbing after that experience because it felt so heavy and raw and heartbreaking. Like that was a really heartbreaking session, that particular one. But, yeah, so I have had a separate experience to the previous one in regards to whether or not I had to make a decision and that was that breathwork session. So I would assume that why I was, that, you know, I've got that memory that I've had to make that decision. I just don't have that clear of it, so to speak. It's interesting though because they, you know, Bessel van der Kolk talks about in his book how the body keeps the score yes. and the fact that you had that memory and then you had a physical response to it mm. is quite yeah. interesting. Yes, yeah. Absolutely. The, and those two experiences were totally different. As I was saying, the one where I had to make the choice, like that was so physically draining. Even just talking about it now, it just, yeah. oh, like it, I feel really heavy at the moment and it just, I could sit here and cry because it was just so heavy. Whereas when I think of the, when I was up there and I had, there was that light and I could feel the love, like it, that just brings me immense joy where it's, but yeah, two totally different experiences. And I came out of that one where I was up there and I felt the presence of my loved ones. I, I was really calm and relaxed and I was at peace. But the previous one, yeah, that was terrible, to be honest. No, it sounds like a decision that no one should really have to make. Yeah. That's very, very difficult. Yeah, absolutely. And tell me, how has your experience informed, you know, you've mentioned that, that you're not scared about death any longer. What other things have you, has it made you put planning in place or? Yeah, I have, I've spoken about what I would like, not in full detail, which I probably need to write that down if I'm honest with myself. I've definitely had conversations about this is what I like. I've made sure that my will is all finalised in regards to assets and all that sort of stuff. So that's all all finalised because I, I did need to make some changes to that and that's all been done. But for me, it's mainly just the, the thought and the discussion around, okay, that if I get sick, this is what I want and, you know, I don't want it to go past this point or, you know, this is what I want for the funeral and I don't want this or I do want that. So it's just making sure that everyone knows I don't want this, this is what I do want and, yeah, and I think that is so important and something that we should all think about, not just when we're older but when we're younger as well, just letting people know what we want and what we don't want. Just voice, like we don't necessarily have to have it written down as long as we've voiced it to those who are closest and dearest to us so they are aware, I think is very important. And your son is in his 20s now? Yeah, he's 20 on Monday. So it makes, it, that comes around to four years on Monday since the wow. event happened. Yeah. How are you feeling about that milestone? Because I don't remember it. I don't. It doesn't bother me. It's just more that because it's my son's birthday, it more because he doesn't like to celebrate his birthdays anymore, so we don't do the birthday cakes. I was trying to focus more on him and also my daughter just to ensure that they're okay. I don't make a big fuss about it with them. If they want to talk about it, we talk about it. But, yeah, I don't know. It's it's It's... And I guess internally, and I've got friends and stuff that are very happy and, and everything, but I just, I try not to make too much of a big deal about it in front of them because I know how traumatic that day was. And, you know, my daughter's a lot more accepting of what happened and will speak about the event, whereas my son's still very closed off and it's not something that he wants to discuss openly, which I get that. And, and as we know, men process differently to women. So, yeah, but... No, I don't know. It's just, it, it's, yeah, it's exciting. And, and I am involved in some cardiac arrest groups and so forth. And, you know, we chat in there. So I guess I actually chat to other cardiac arrest survivors about these milestones because they understand. And, you know, we all understand that our families, it's very hard for them to celebrate these 
moments not everyone has difficulty celebrating the moment, those these particular days, but I'm finding out a lot of people and loved ones and, and friends of those who have suffered a cardiac arrest, they do struggle with it. So, yeah. I remember seeing an interview recently, and I think we mentioned it when we initially met a few weeks ago, and that was Greg Page, the former Yellow Wiggle, yeah. and we when he had his cardiac arrest and he was on SBS Insight and he was talking about how he also has no memory of that period and his wife has all the memories of that period and she, you know, obviously is very similar, the story about the impact that that has on loved ones around. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And tell me, you're now, you know, really made your purpose of your life to educate people about what's the plumbing and what's the electrician, which yep. is, I think, is fantastic. <laughs> How do your your friends and family feel about that? No, everyone, well, everyone's really pleased and 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 happy that I'm I'm doing that because I guess they can see the fire in my belly of what excites me in regards to you know just educating people on this and helping save lives because at the end of the day that's what I want to do I just want want to save a person's loved one so that yeah, they get to spend more quality time with each other and so they're all very supportive and very yeah if I need anything they're always there on the end of the phone or in person if I need to run something by them they're like, yeah, great idea, or maybe, oh, what about this? And you know, so they're great for bouncing ideas off, and and always, they've always got my back. And your kids, how do they feel about it? My son's very much doesn't want to know a lot about. He knows what I do and stuff, but he's not really big on the details. Whereas my daughter's very open about it. She's good. She always throws an idea here and there every now and then. And apparently, I need to get on TikTok. <laughs> Which um, I'll just steer clear of that. <laughs> but, you know, they're good. They're, like My daughter particularly is more supportive than my son, but I totally understand why with my son because he did experience a lot more of the, you know, the, the visual and the physical trauma that he has to, had to go through with seeing what I was going through. And tell me, what's the future for Heart Matters? Well, the future is... That I would like to just keep educating on CPR. I'd love to get into schools, particularly secondary schools. And just, you know, I think CPR is something that our politicians need to look at, maybe putting on the curriculum. Um, Because I think that's a very important life skill that, you know, that we should have from a very early age. The younger we learn it and if we keep continuing that, you know, with the updating, the upgrades of any you know, new information that comes to light with CPR, if we can keep that going on for our young ones, it just becomes second nature. So by the time we hit adulthood or by the time the kids hit adulthood, it's going to be like riding a bike to them, which is what we need. And certainly for me, it's just, yeah, that's what it's about for Heart Matters is getting out there and getting defibrillators out in communities. That's a big passion for me is to get as many defibrillators out as we can, you know, and the cost, there's a cost involved with doing that. So I guess at some point I would really love to have Heart Matters Australia with the the training side of things and then maybe a Heart Matters Foundation so that, you know, we can get, have money coming in and then putting that money straight back out into communities in the form of a defibrillator that's accessible. So, yeah, that's what I want to do and just some public speaking to sort of raise the awareness of what cardiac arrest is. And what... How could people support you and the future of Heart Matters Australia? The way they can support me is just by learning CPR. Book a course. I teach first aid, teach CPR. We also teach first aid in an education and care setting. So there's a variety of courses there that cover everyone. I do a CPR and AED awareness session, which if people don't want that formal qualification, it's an hour and a half session where I can come to your home, your business, and I teach you how to perform effective CPR. And you also have the opportunity to sit down and have a play with the defibrillator, put the pads on the mannequins and, 
you know, just follow the prompt, see how it works so that we take that fear out of using a defibrillator. So to support is to learn CPR, book a course, and if you want to help with getting defibrillators out in communities, I have a donation tab on my page. You can donate $5, $2, $10, a couple of hundred dollars if you like, and that money goes straight towards purchasing a defibrillator that will be donated to a local community. Well, Justine, we'll certainly make sure that we have all of that information in the show notes and certainly encourage people to donate and, you know, get behind the training in their places of employment and also education. And I just really thank you for being honest and open and sharing your story with us today. It's been really insightful. Thank you so much. No, thank you for having me. And for me, my, the biggest thing I can do is share my story, which helps raise awareness on cardiac arrest, but also the importance of knowing how to perform CPR, particularly for our children. If we can help them, provide them with a life skill so that you know, if they ever do find themselves in a situation where they're home alone with a parent, a grandparent, an aunt, that if anything does happen to them, we provide them with the knowledge and the skills of what they need to do so that if anything happens they can just go and do it and hopefully that person is okay and we can reduce the trauma that they're going to experience and I guess that's probably the biggest thing for me is reducing people's trauma in these sorts of events it's not going to eliminate the trauma it's just going to reduce the trauma and you sharing your story is so powerful and a beautiful way in which you could do that. Oh, thank you thank so you. much. No, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Justine. Don't be caught dead forgetting to subscribe. And here are some more videos we know you'll love. <laughs>